welcome to the great detectives of old time radio from Boise, Idaho. This is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, email it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and become one of our friends on Facebook. Facebook.com slash Radio Detectives. And don't forget our Instagram, Instagram.com slash Great Detectives. If you've not already, I do encourage you to check out my uh, book, All I Needed to Know I Learned from Columbo, or All I Needed to Know I Learned from Dragnet. Each uh, of these two ebooks examines the careers and histories of seven great fictional detectives and life lessons that can be learned from them. Uh, they are available as ebooks or also as audiobooks through audible.com or the Apple Store. And you can find all my books, audiobooks, and ebooks over at store.greatdetectives.net. Well, now it is time for this week's episode of Follow Vance. The original air date is November the 28th, 1946, and the title is The Blue Lady Murder Case. <laughs> Is that you, Vance? Yes, Markham. Well, the district attorney is behind a locked door. Most interesting, Markham. How do I get in? This way, Vance. Am I unlocking the door? Good evening, Vance. Hello, Markham. All this secrecy indicates an occasion I should enjoy. Am I correct? It's quite possible, Vance. Please sit down. Thank you. Well, you sent for me, Markham. I'm here. Shall we ask your other visitor to come in here from the next room so we can get started? You knew I had someone waiting next door? Certainly. You wouldn't lock yourself in, Markham. As long as I've known you, I've never seen you display a single evidence of fear. You locked your door, therefore you are trying to protect someone. Whom? <laughs> My only surprise is that you didn't know that, too. It's an informer, Vance, a stool pigeon. Come in, Ricker. Yeah, D.A., here I am. Ricker, this is Philo Vance. I want you to tell him what you told me a while ago. Ah, oh, gee, D.A., what I told you was personal, just between friends. Please include me among your friends, then, Ricker. Do I have to tell this guy what I told you, D.A.? I wish you would. Okay, then, okay. Listen, Vance, the D.A. and I has got a deal. When I hear something he ought to know, only nobody will tell him, I tell him, see? Nobody will tell him, so you tell him. Sure, sure. Listen, Vance, there's a dame due to hit this town this week, and she's going to start running things here the same as she ran them in the Midwest. And where she goes, trouble goes to big trouble. Killings, bank holdups, kidnappings, the works. Yeah, that's what I was telling the D.A. A woman is coming to town, and that means trouble, eh? Well, that's not too strange an association. Well, I don't know about that. All I know is this town's going to break wide open when she shows up, and that's going to be soon. Really? Ricker, tell me, who is this woman? You mean, what's her name? Well, search me, I don't know. All I know is she's tall and dark and terrific-looking. And she always wears dresses of one color only. Nobody knows her name. Everybody calls her the Lady in Blue. It would be my suggestion, Danny, not to let the Lady in Blue into this office. Legal advice or a friendly tip? A friendly tip, Danny, actuated by the fact that I wish to be retained by you as your lawyer for quite some time yet. Meaning I may not be around long running things if I let the lady in blue in here. Huh? Well, we'll see. Uh, Davy, let her come in. Out, mouthpiece, that door there. Call me later. I hope you will be able to answer the phone when I do. <sighs> Bye. Davy, I said to send that... D Hello, Danny. Well, aren't you going to ask me to sit down, Danny? 
Um, uh, I am as soon as I can breathe normal again. You're the lady in blue? That's what I've been called. You knew I was coming to town? Everybody knew it. What do you want with me? I'd like to do business with you, Danny. Things are a little slow where I came from. I need activity. I can find things to do here. Things you're already doing. All right, all right, I get that. But the way you look, the way you're dressed, the way you talk, what do you want with rackets? Rackets, Danny? I'm not associated with any rackets. I do things more legitimately. My methods may be a little illegal, but my uh, enterprises aren't. For instance, you're in a racket. I've suddenly decided to uh, be your partner. Nice deciding. What if I don't like? I know you brought a couple of your boys along, so don't think I'm being tough. No, you're too smart to play that way, Danny. You have a bodyguard in the next room. I have one of my boys watching him. I don't know about yours, but mine shoots straight. And often. Do we talk business? Take that hood of yours out of here, lady, and you go with him. We don't have nothing to talk about. No. Tony! Don't let him come in, Davy. You call me, lady? Davy here is giving me some trouble. <laughs> Davy! He shot Davy! Only in his arm. I don't like guys that pull guns. You call me, lady? Yes, Tony. Just as a protective measure. Danny, we'll drop our business discussion for the day, but uh, we'll meet again. We'll meet again, lady. I promise you that. I'll find out what your game is. I'm sure you will. Only, as a glance in the next room will tell you, we're both playing the same game. But the score is one to nothing. In my favor. <laughs> How do you do, madame? May I help you with your selection? It's quite possible. You own the shop? Yes, I am Madame Marie. Madame, you have a beautiful figure. And I have the creation that will set off the blue of your eyes. Please come with me. We can do business here, Madame Marie. I'm not interested in gowns. I'm interested in working for you. Working? A woman like you is... is Looking for a position? Uh, not exactly. Madame Marie, effective today, everything which you purchase from manufacturers here and abroad must go through me, a service for which I charge 10%. You understand? No. No, I do not. <laughs> you will. Oh, now there's a beautiful gown, that blue evening model. An import, of course. How much is it? $400. But I still do not know what you're trying to do. I need no one to buy for me. You'll change your mind. I'll take that gown. Send it to me at the Ritzmore Suite 928. Oh, 400, you said? Very well, here you are. Good day, Madame Marie. Oh, uh, you'll be hearing from me. Oh, dear, what does this mean? Evelyn, I'm not to be disturbed. I'm going into my office. A thing like this cannot happen. Yes? Yeah. Monsieur Danny? Never mind the monsieur business. I got trouble enough. Danny, this is Marie from the dress shop. Six months ago, I joined your... your association. You promised me I'd never be disturbed by anyone. Just now, I was disturbed. By a tall, good-looking doll dressed in blue? Yes. She didn't know I was already a member of your association, did she? I mean, that must be it. She just didn't know. She ain't no all right. Only she told me she's moving in and she's doing it. I'm going to see her. Something tells me she's going to be moving right out again. Sit down, Danny. We're quite alone, and there's nothing for you to be afraid of. Do you like my new gown? I bought it today. I like the gown, lady. It's your ideas on doing business I don't like. You're cutting in on Madame Marie, I understand. Well, as long as you understand, I see no need to discuss it further. 
Do you like the gun really, Dan? Listen, lady, I don't like what's going on here. I was doing all right. I was doing fine until you cut yourself in. I'm not taking it, lady. I'm telling you now, I'm not taking it. Well, Danny, there isn't really anything you can do. Look, would you care to take me to the theater tonight? I'll wear this new blue gown. I've some wonderful blue eyeshadow that matches and luminous stardust for my hair. You'll be very proud of me, Danny. You, uh, you want me to take you to the theater? Hey, lady, you go for me a little? Why? Why? On account of you're only the most terrific dame I've ever seen, that's why. So you want me to take you to the theater? Is it a date, Danny? Oh, well, could be, lady, could be. So you like me a little, huh? Well, I like you a lot, lady. You got what I ain't got. Class. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, lady, come here a minute. I always wanted to know what it would feel like to have a swell dame like you in my arms. Come here, lady, come on. You want me closer? Real close? Like this? Oh, lady. Oh, lady, this is living. Hey, what did you clip me for? I step on ants when they start to crawl, Danny. You affect me the same way. Oh, I do, huh? You don't want to play then, do you? Except rough. Okay, if that's the way you want it, that's the way you're going to get it. Lady, you're going to be sorry you slapped me in a kisser. Take my word for it. Really? What are you going to do? Plenty. I'll fix you for this, lady, beginning now. You know that date we had for the theater? Well, it's off. Fool around with that. Well, Mr. Markham, we got another murder. So I see, Sergeant Heath. Danny Claxton, isn't it? It was. That's the way we found him, lying face up here in his apartment, knife in his heart. Hmm. Vance will be interested in that when he gets here, Heath. Coincidentally, I had to wake him up. After all, only homicide detectives and district attorneys stay awake all night. Well, call him back and tell him to stay away, D.A. We can solve this murder without him. I'll have the guy who knocked off Claxton within a week. You know, Heath, I was living in hopes that you'd bring Claxton in one of these days so we could send him up the river where he belongs. Apparently, well, someone sent him down the river. Hello, Markham. Well, hello, Vance. Sorry to get you out of bed. I'm sorry you got out of bed, too. Good evening, Sergeant Heath. Hmm. So this is a big-time racketeer's apartment. And that a big-time racketeer's corpse. We're waiting for some men from the morgue to remove the body, Vance. Hmm. Sergeant Heath has had the knife that killed Claxon taken to headquarters. Sure did. It's being checked for fingerprints right now. I hope you find some. A knife killed Claxton, eh, Markham? Yes, Vance, a knife. And now we have a corpse, and so far, three suspects. Really? Who are they? Well, there's the lady in blue whom we were warned about last night, remember, by my personal informer? Yes, of course. And there's a cold-blooded killer named Tony who works for the lady. We got him right away, but he's out on bail. Wonderful device, that business of bail. Who's the third? A former attorney who was Danny's business advisor, a man named Smythe. Also out on bail, I suppose? Mm Mm-hmm. Oh, Heath. Yeah, Vance? What can't I do for you? Find anything in the room that might be a clue? Not a thing. But maybe you will. You generally do. But look, don't bother me, Vance. I'm busy. Vance, do you want to look around or shall we go? We might just as well go. Apparently, there are no clues to be uncovered. Coming, Sergeant Heath? Sure, I'm coming. I'll leave a man outside the door to wait for those guys from morgue. Turn off the light, will you, D.A.? Certainly. Holy mackerel, it's dark in here. (coughs) Open the door, will you, D.A.? It's right next to the switch. Certainly, I've got it right here. Don't open that door, Markham. Don't do it for a second, anyhow. Hey, Vance, what are you staring into a dark room for? You can't see anything. Hey, where, where'd you go? I'm over here by the body, Heath. And I did see something. Something very interesting. In the dark? Yes. You can open that door now if you like, Markham. Hey, Vance, what could you possibly see on that corpse in a dark room? I'll tell you about it sometime, Sergeant Heath. At about the same time that I tell it to the murderer. <laughs> The 
This is District Attorney Markham. The Blue Lady murder case developed as a result of the knifing of Danny Claxton, whose reign as racket king has been challenged by a glamorous woman known as the Lady in Blue. As Vance had anticipated, there were no fingerprints on the knife. Suspects include the Lady, her favorite gunman, Tony, and a disbarred lawyer named Smythe who might well inherit Claxton's racket empire with him dead. Vance found some sort of clue in Claxton's darkened apartment after I'd asked him there, and, since all suspects are out on bail, he phoned to tell me he was going to the Ritzmore Hotel to see the lady in blue. He should be there about... Please sit down, Mr. Vance. I've been waiting to meet you. And, uh, it's been worth waiting for. Thank you. You know, if there should be a mental contest between us, one of us must lose. In view of that and my self-confidence, I appreciate your hospitality. You mean if there is a contest, I won't win? <laughs> if you knew as much about me as I about you, you might not be so certain. We're very much alike. I'd hate to believe that. You and Danny Claxton didn't like each other, did you? Oh, I wouldn't say that exactly. He was quite fond of me. That's not difficult to understand. You know, Vance, I'd like you to tell me something. Something about me. Yes? What do you think of me? Are you quite sure you want me to tell you? Quite. Well, as a woman, you're perfectly gowned, beautiful, and exciting. Exciting, Vance? Very much so. Many men must have fallen in love with you. Many men? Yes, the one man? No. <clears throat> Is there uh, something else I might tell you about yourself? You've told me what I wanted to hear. There's no question about that. Of course, I could go further. Let's take the surface, you. The gown you're wearing is startling, but it's right for you. Your jewelry is exquisite. Your hair becoming fashionable, but too perfectly groomed. Nothing is wrong with you, lady. Therefore, something is wrong with you. Oh, please don't stop, Vance. If I were you, I don't think I'd strive so for effect. That hairdo of yours, for instance. What are those little things that glisten on top of it? Oh, that's stardust. When lights hit it, it has the effect of sparkling. You couldn't possibly be content to not stand out when there are no lights. A theater, for example. No, you're quite right. For occasions like that, there's a luminous stardust I use. Mm, sounds wonderful. Oh, Vance. Vance, I like you. You're the man I never met in my life. Do you understand what I mean? I think so. And under other circumstances, something might be done about that. Not under these? I'm afraid not. I'm engaged in a murder investigation. Though I must admit that for the last few moments I've neglected it a bit. Will you tell me something? Anything. Uh, within reason. Danny Claxton was murdered in his apartment last night. Were you ever in that apartment? No. So the contest commences. The gauntlet has been hurled. And the challenge accepted. Oh, expecting company. Not that I know of. I was just leaving. I'll answer the door. Lady, may I say that this has been one of the most pleasant interviews I've ever had? Just a moment. I'm glad you've said that, Vance. No matter what happens from here in, I'll remember that. You did something to me. I shouldn't like what you did. But I do. Goodbye. Goodbye. Oh, Mr. Smythe. Uh, Go right in. Yes. Uh, lady, I've got to talk to you. Uh, what, uh, what did Vance want here? What is it you want here? Well, lady, I worked for Danny Claxton. I know everything he did, how he operated, who paid him and whom he paid. I, uh, I imagine you're taking over here. <laughs> I could be valuable to you. My intention in coming here was to take over. No, I'm not so sure. I beg your pardon? Nothing. So you want to transfer your allegiance from the dead to the living, Mr. Smythe? You want to serve me. <laughs> With Danny out of the way, why not? Was it you who saw to it that Danny was 
out of the way? Uh, did I kill him? Why, lady, what difference does that make? <laughs> the king is dead. Long live the queen. Wait a minute, Mr. Markham. Let me go to work on this Tony here. I talk a language you can understand. Tony, sit up in that chair. Don't bother me. He's all yours, Sergeant Heath. I hope you get something out of him. You have my best wishes, but also my gravest doubts. He'll talk to you. Tony, listen. You bore me, copper. I'll bore you. I'll do something to you, but you leave me. Look, you worked for the lady in blue. She told you to knock off Danny Claxton, so you knocked him off. With a knife? Sure, with a knife. Oh, I know all about how you're a gun toter. I know your reputation, but you pulled a switch to toss us off. You hoped. You killed Claxton, didn't you? Well, did you or didn't you? Didn't I? Go away, Heath. Go far away. I guarantee nobody will look for you. You start talking or nobody will ever find you. Tony, get this. Hold it, you... Heath. Who is it? It's I, Markham. Vance. Wait a second, Vance. I'll be right out. Tony... You killed Danny Claxton, and I'm going to prove it. Hello, Vance. Glad I found you, Markham. That sounds like you've got news on the Claxton killing, Vance. Oh, that. I suspected last night who killed Claxton. You did? Certainly. This afternoon, I visited the lady in blue. Just as I was leaving, Claxton's former employee, Mr. Spive, came in. My appearance there was very fortunate. You see, I thought I'd known who killed Claxton. But now I have proof. Well, man, don't just stand there as if you told me it looked like it might rain tomorrow. Who killed Claxton? I know, Markham, but I have no evidence that would satisfy a jury. Ask the lady in blue, her friend Tony, and Mr. Smythe up to my apartment at nine tonight. You and Heath be there, too. I think I'll supply the proof we need at that time. May I take the liberty of using a moment or two to describe this knife I'm holding? Come on, Vance. I've wasted enough time getting these three people up to your apartment. A moment more won't hurt, Heath. Now, please, everyone, look at this knife. It's Arabian. The handle is of ivory, and the blade solid steel. I've selected this knife because it closely resembles the one used to kill Danny Claxton. Now, for the purpose of this experiment, I need an assistant. Someone to pose as the murderer. May I ask the lady in blue? Why, certainly, Vance. What is it you'd like me to do? Well, for one thing, I'd like you to look slightly less glamorous. It's completely demoralizing, distracting, and downright inconsiderate. Really? I was hoping you'd like this gown. That's why I wore it. Mm -hmm. uh, will you take this knife, please, lady, and hold it in your right hand? Like this? That's fine. Thank you. Markham. Yes? Please stand over by the door. Next to the light switch, will you? Of course, I'll be right over here. Now, Tony, please don't fall asleep. This might be interesting to you. Yeah, I know. And Mr. Smythe, <coughs> I'd like you in particular to watch and see how close I come to showing exactly how Danny Claxton was killed. First, let me ask all three of you. Were any of you ever in Mr. Claxton's apartment? I never was. Not me. <coughs> well, uh, I'd been there, but not in the past week. <coughs> Very well. Now, my very intriguing lady in blue, you have the knife. I'm going to show everyone what happened the other night. You, lady, will pretend to be the murderer. I'll be Claxton. Now, you slip up behind me. Please get behind me. Throw your left arm around my neck. As you do that, I try to reach back with my hand to seize the knife like this. Vance, be careful. You're ruining my hairdo with your hands. I'm sorry. Markham, will you turn out the lights, please, all of them? Turn out the lights? I don't know why either, Heath, but maybe I'd better turn them off. Okay. Only I don't see a thing. Neither does anybody. I think you will now. Everybody, please look at my right hand. The hand that just touched the hair of the lady in blue. Vance, your hand is glowing. Hey, what have you got on your hand, Vance? Radium? Not exactly. It's just proof that the lady in blue stabbed Claxton. You were too clever, Vance. But you'll never live to prove what you think. I'll see to it. Vance, she's got that knife. Look out. Oh, Heath, the oh, lights. Turn on those lights. Right, yes, D.A. She stabbed Vance. Heath, do something. Do something. I'll do something, all right, D.A. I'll open that door, let my cops in. We'll drag her downtown. That isn't necessary. You want me at headquarters, I'll go. Mr. Markham. Yes? You saw me stab Vance. 
I killed Claxton the same way. I don't know how Vance figured it, and we'll never know now. But he was right. I'm ready, Mr. Markham. Nothing's very important anymore. I've just killed the only man that ever interested me. Come in, Markham, come in. Hi, Vance. Sleep well? Wonderfully. Sorry I had to put on that act last night. Did it scare you? Definitely. Let's see that trick knife of yours, Vance. Nothing much to it, Markham. Here it is. The blade disappears into the handle when you touch the point. See? Why, yes, of course. <laughs> had me worried for a while last night, though. Oh, Vance, I know now that she killed Claxton, but you knew before. Was it whatever you found when we turned out the lights in Claxton's apartment that told you the lady in blue had killed him? Yes, it was. It was Claxton's right hand, Markham. It glowed in the dark. Because it had touched the hair of the lady in blue, and on her hair was a glamour accessory, a phosphorescent preparation known as stardust. Oh, I see. As soon as I found the lady in blue wore stardust, I knew it was she who'd been at Claxton's apartment. Ah, the lady in blue was a lovely woman, Vance. Lovely to look at. But hardly delightful to know. Though for a moment at her apartment yesterday afternoon, I was beginning to find it hard to believe that. Well, Vance, you did it again. Yes, Markham, I guess this is the end of the Blue Lady murder case. But I wish the lady in blue had had a different beginning. <laughs> Welcome back. Well, an interesting premise, and if you or anyone you love uh, has ever had to deal with a lot of glitter, which I think the the stuff the blue lady was wearing sounds like some sort of, you know, I, I guess, uh, ancestor uh, in some way. I'm not that familiar with the history of makeup to say for sure, but that stuff, you know, you just can't get out. And so it's definitely understandable. It could leave a lot of evidence at the uh, crime scene that would certainly indicate her involvement because she uses some very striking makeup, which can be left at the scene of the crime. Uh, you know, and I think though that is my problem with this episode, is that they really built her up to be this very shrewd, ruthless, and clever criminal. And she ends up being caught in a murder that's really not that well thought out. You know, I think it goes back to one of uh, Chesterton's Father Brown mysteries, where he, you know, essentially said because of fallibility, because uh, people aren't perfect, most people are capable of murder, but people have their own personalities, styles, and uh, approaches, so not every person is capable of every murder. Uh, so this murder, the way that it was played out, doesn't feel like it was something that she was that she would do, uh, despite the fact that she did indeed 
uh, do it. So, you know, if you write someone who is that clever, you can't just have them perform a silly murder on, you know, very thin basis and where they leave behind, you know, a lot of incriminating indicators. Uh, and the, another interesting thing, and it's kind of weird uh, because, you know, this is not the first episode I've heard with Philo Vance getting very flirty with a suspect. And, you know, it's odd uh, because you know, if there was any detective that you could imagine who, you know, women would be attracted to and there would be a lot of flirtiness going on, it would be someone like Boston Blackie. Uh, who, which was also produced by Ziv Productions. Philo Vance, I just don't see it. I, I don't see him as a ladies' man. Certainly, I don't think that that was a major feature of his portrayal. Although I think in one of the movies, he did have a little bit of rom of a romantic interest. He's just not the type of character that I see it. It's it's odd, but it does seem the direction Ziv uh, is going with him. So I guess that'll be interesting to see how they play that out in future episodes. Now it is time to thank our Patreon supporter of the day. And I want to go ahead and thank Daniel. Daniel's been uh, one of our Patreon supporters since March of 2020. Again, thanks so much for the support, Daniel. And uh, that will do it for today. Uh, I do want to encourage you, if you're enjoying this podcast, to rate and review it wherever you're downloading your podcast from. Next Thursday, we'll bring you another episode of Philo Vance. Join us back here tomorrow for an episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar, where... Expense account item one, $158.16. Plane fare and incidentals, Hartford to Santa Barbara. My mid-morning arrival was timed for the sun and the sea to show off a sizable and pleasantly crowded harbor, some sprawling hotels, two lush green golf courses, and acres and acres of snug, expensive homes. At the police station, my contact, a Sergeant Lopez, was out, so I went over to the Harbor Inn and met the victimized hotel operator, Glenn Sheridan. Tall, gray-haired, slacks, sports shirt, suntan, and sandals. <laughs> On the face of it, you'd think I'd been in the hotel business 20 minutes instead of 20 years, the way that woman took me. Well, she's done the same thing in several other nice hotels up and down the coast, if that's any comfort. Well, it isn't. I suppose the thing that bothers me most is that if she walked through that door right now and told me none of it was true, I'd probably believe her. She was that good. Mr. Dollar, she was the best. Why, she pranced in here as big as life, and I probably didn't have a nickel in her purse. I hope you'll be with us then. In the meantime, do send your comments to box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and become one of our friends on Facebook, facebook.com slash Radio Detectives. Uh, from Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, signing off.